Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton, and I'm now into my second half century of post-lockdown economic outlooks. Uh, today, Monday, is, in case you didn't know it, I learned from the Financial Times this morning, World Speech Day, promoting the, and I quote, the wisdoms, plural, of over 1,000 global speakers. Well, I'm not one of them, but I can do hot air as well as most. So here goes. Considering that uh, my position on the coronavirus was, and indeed still is, that in the end we will have to get used to it as we've become used to uh, periodic eruptions of other diseases, I can't say that I'm happy that we in the United Kingdom are still in lockdown, particularly when I see that most of the United States, including Texas, Florida, and now New York, pretty much is back to normal, notwithstanding the fact that only 19% uh, of Americans have so far been vaccinated compared with apparently 33% of Brits. Still, I guess there is indeed still some light at the end of the tunnel, even though what can I call him, Lord Whitty of Wuhan, and others in the science cult have been uh, continuing to warn that premature easing will cause hundreds of thousands of extra deaths. Well, maybe. I saw this weekend's demo on Clapham Common, and uh, it seems to me pretty obvious now that our tolerance for yet another extension of house arrest is almost exhausted. I hope that... Uh, Boris Johnson and his advisors take note. So what sort of world will we be entering into when, when the COVID express finally exits the tunnel of despair? Well, I've already given you my deeply pessimistic predictions, but I'll repeat them. First, I think it'll be a more unequal society in that during the pandemic, those with secure jobs in the public sector, in the NHS, in the logistics industry, even in media, have made out like bandits pushing the uh, savings rate up to astronomic, almost record levels and causing many economists to predict a massive spending binge when we are finally allowed to blow the egg money. Well, pretty much the same applies to those who already had substantial financial assets. They've done well, surprisingly so in my opinion. On the other hand, the lower paid workers in the private sector, gig workers and uh, the self-employed, including Startup entrepreneurs have done desperately badly, and they will bear the scars for a generation. In other words, the rich will have got richer and the poor will have got poorer. Second, I think it'll be a much more statist society. Every day I read somewhere a takedown of the aphorism attributed variously to Reagan or Thatcher that the eight most dangerous words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Well, actually, that's nine words. The problem is that I personally heard Dennis Healy say exactly the same thing on at least half a dozen occasions. And he was hardly a Tory. Uh, but that was then. Now the pendulum has swung and we are forced, forced to acknowledge government's essential goodness and applaud the fact that it is just going to get bigger and bigger. Third, I think it's going to be a stickier society, uh, both socially and geographically, in that in, in particular travel is likely to become much more difficult and much more expensive. And finally, I think it'll become less free. The libertarian impulse in almost all of us, certainly in me, will, I fear, be undermined by an increasing impetus towards authoritarianism. Bureaucrats who have had power, considerable power, won't willingly give it all up. And, uh, and I fear for all sorts of reasons, uh, there is now much less support for dissent from the prevailing narrative than I can ever remember. Still, even if I don't particularly like the look of the post-COVID landscape, it is getting closer. And as 
I said, the high savings rate coupled with very limited opportunities to go out and spend over the last year have convinced many otherwise sane people that the second half of this year is going to see a consumer binge, the like of which we haven't seen since the barber boom. Personally, I'm still a tad skeptical, but there's no doubt that in the US at least, Bally Biden's stimulus bill, which he signed into law last Friday, which happened to be the anniversary of the WT WHO's declaration of a global pandemic, is a major reason for the expectation of a major boom. It isn't actually 1.9 trillion, shorn of the increase in the federal minimum wage and with tougher uh, thresholds on the $1,400 check that for US households, it's probably closer to 1.7 trillion, but it's still enormous and still far more than the so-called output gap would seem to warrant. Gene Sperling, who is now tipped uh, to uh, oversee implementation of the plan, is going to have his hands full. The problem is that uh, with the media, American and international, still, as it were, in the tank for Biden, nothing that he does can be criticized, just as nothing that Trump did, not even his warp speed vaccine program can be praised. So we don't get very much objective analysis of the, uh, of the stimulus package. But is the niftily named American rescue plan really necessary? Well, it certainly is if you believe Treasury Secretary Yellen or even Fed Chairman Powell, both of whom argue that uh, fiscal and monetary policy has to go big um, if the true level of unemployment in the US is to be pushed back to pre-pandemic levels. However, it probably isn't warranted if one simply looks at where the global or indeed the US economy stands today. Last week, for instance, the OECD published its newly updated economic forecasts for 2021 and 2022. There are some outliers. Projections for GDP growth this year have, for instance, been cut in both Saudi Arabia and Russia, despite the rise in oil prices, which I find a bit odd. But for most advanced countries, the outlook has improved significantly from the organization's last forecasts in, in December. In the US, for instance, GDP growth this year is now put at 6.5% up from uh, an estimate of 3.2% in December. For the UK, we're now looking at 5.1% growth up from 4.2%. And for Germany, 3% up from 2.8%. True, China may only do, my heart bleeds, may only do 7.8% this year, down from an earlier forecast of 8.2%. Oh, but I should add that is still a good deal stronger than the target of around of around 6% growth that was announced at last week's National People's Congress, which suggests, at least to me, that Beijing is going to tighten the fiscal and monetary screws a couple of turns over the next two or three months. After all, about 6% is still pretty damn good. Obviously, the biggest impact of Biden's package will be on the US, though we'll be all affected by the wash in one way or another. The problem, as I see it, is that the impact of the stimulus will be to boost US GDP growth by around 100 basis points, which suggests to me that if it hadn't passed, the US economy would still be growing this year at around 5.5%. True, that uh, may still have left a hard core of unemployed, but it's a pretty fierce rate for a mature economy to grow at, even one which is coming out of a pandemic. It emphasizes to me just how radical, or to use the vogue word progressive, the Biden administration now is. Commentators are harking back to LBJ's Great Society program in the 1960s, but that was more about civil rights. Uh, it makes more sense, at least to me, to compare this administration with that of FDR, particularly when one looks at 
key appointments like Gary Gensler at the SEC, Rohit Sharma at the CFPB, the Consumer Finance Protection Board, and the whole team in the environment and energy area. And of course, Janet Yellen seems to have uh, been reborn at Treasury. Um, there's a lot to say about this. It seems to me to be a bit odd, given Biden's long history in the Senate as a moderate centrist. It suggests to me either that he's been converted to the progressive cause, perhaps by his wife, or more likely to me that at 78 and declining a bit, he has just decided to go with the flow, letting others, perhaps Kamala Harris, whom we haven't heard from very much, determine the direction of, of policy. I note, for instance, that he hasn't yet held an open press conference and that he hasn't yet tried to defend his economic policies in public. The test will come over the next few months when the administration's agenda is said to include, first of all, and a new infrastructure bill, which could add, add several trillion dollars to government spending, an immigration bill, which is going to be a big test uh, following Biden's decision last week to uh, let 320,000 Venezuelans who were in the country illegally stay and indeed work. And given the fact that there's upwards of a million Central Americans heading north in the fond belief that uh, a Biden administration is going to let them into the US. Third, there's going to be police reform, which obviously is going to be an exceptionally divisive issue in a sort of George Floyd era. And there's also going to be uh, an attack uh, on what progressives call continuing Republican attempts to suppress minority voting. After all, conservatives see this as a blatant attempt to enfranchise as many die-hard Democrats as possible, even at the risk of encouraging electoral fraud. That too is going to be very divisive. So there are tough times ahead, but as long as the Republican brand is tainted by Trump's continued presence, indeed his continued existence, progressives appear to have a free ride and they seem determined to use it. As for the US economy, well, last week confirmed, I think that with or without extra stimulus, the United States is coming out of the pandemic recession pretty strongly. In particular, job openings were up quite sharply in January to 6.92 million. Uh, initial jobless claims fell in the latest week to the lowest level since November, and the flash estimate for the quite important Michigan Confidence Index, which came out last Friday, rose in March from uh, 76.8 to 83.0. All of that's prompted. All of that has prompted new fears about inflation, and indeed. The United States CPI rose from 1.4% to 1.7% in February, which admittedly is still well below the Fed's 2% target. Still, it is worth note, noting that producer prices, the PPI, rose from 1.7% to 2.8% in February, suggesting that the conditions are indeed there for a rise in inflation to overshoot and to overshoot quite considerably the Fed's target later this year. That's led to a significant impact on US bond markets. Two weeks ago, the 10-year benchmark treasury yield was 1.5, 150 basis points, and the long bond yield was 223. By the close last Friday, the 10-year yield was 163, and the 30-year yield was 238, which is a pretty significant jump. As for US equities, however, well, Biden's uh, stimulus package has set the balls loose again. By the close on Friday, both the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the wider S&P 500 were at record levels. And although the NASDAQ, the tech-heavy NASDAQ, was down from its all-time highs, it too was up 3.1% for the week after three weekly falls. So equity traders are clearly banking on an accommodative Fed and a pretty torrid recovery.
Closer to home, the European Central Bank is also promising accommodation, pledging last week to expand its own bond buying program with the aim of stopping what it calls contagion from the US bond market sell-off. So far, it's had mm, some success, but a rally in German bunds after the ECB had spoken quickly fizzled. Bond markets are looking a little toppy here too. In general, I'm inclined to think that the Eurozone economy is indeed lagging the US. However, last week was pretty positive in the EU at the European, at the Eurozone level, for instance, industrial production was up 0.8% in January and the Centix Investor Confidence Index rose from minus 0.2 to plus five in March. That's a big move. French and Italian industrial production also came in higher than expected. But on the other hand, German industrial production fell sharply in January off 2.5% for the month and 3.9% year on year. Oddly enough, it looks to me as though all of a sudden Germany seems to be the focus of concern. And it's possible that a weak economy is one of the underlying reasons for the sudden political resurgence of both the Greens and the hard left. Um, with the CDU, Merkel's CDU, having been crushed over the weekend in two important regional elections in Baden-Württemberg and Rhineland-Palatinate, uh, a scandal over COVID masks, the procurement of COVID masks was clearly one factor, but the economy also didn't help. Not only that, but uh, in addition to industrial production, inflation in Germany is also picking up and is now higher than almost anywhere else in Europe. It was 1.6% in February. As for here in the UK, well, our sainted chancellor warned the Treasury Select Committee last week that, and I quote, public finances are much more sensitive to changes in interest rates and inflation than they were previously. And that's true, particularly with borrowing at record levels. What he can do about it, however, uh, is harder to imagine after all. Like for like, retail sales were up 9.5% year on year in February, which is pretty damn strong, and house prices are still rising. That said, well, I think we are still lagging the EU in terms of the pace of recovery, and the EU is lagging the US. After all, it was also reported in Britain last week that industrial production was down 1.5% in January, while manufacturing was off 2.3%. And it was also announced that GDP was off 2.9% in January, after, admittedly after a rise of 1.2% in December, which left it down 9.2% year on year. There's also some concern here about the external account. Although the overall trade, and this is forgot, easily forgotten, although the overall trade deficit actually narrowed uh, from 6.2 billion uh, to 1.6 billion pounds in January, it was reported, and I have to say it was reported gleefully by those who predicted disaster post-Brexit, that UK exports to the EU27 fell 41% in January, while imports from the EU were off 29%. This was partially, indeed possibly largely, due to stockpiling, but it's also a testimony to the fact that our former friends in Brussels don't seem keen to make the UK's transition easy. Uh, I suppose that means that one should say a a couple of words about the post-Brexit situation. I fear that it was another bad week for London with Mr. Sefcovic and his friends reacting poorly to what I thought was a rather sensible decision by Bojo to uh, allow another six month delay in full implementation of the UK's border checks with Northern Ireland. We are, after all, still in a pandemic that has disrupted uh, economies and bureaucrats all over Europe. The problem is that there seems to be very little willingness on either side to compromise. And as a result, the UK is 
having to start to look elsewhere and to abandon its initial hope of a sort of comprehensive equivalence uh, ruling, in the, at least in the financial field. As a result of that, it's been reported that the UK Treasury will shortly issue new proposals for modifying key EU-derived legislation, notably this mysterious thing called MIFID II, with the aim of undercutting Brussels and of reinforcing the UK's global competitiveness. That will go down like a lead balloon in Brussels. As for European markets, well, equities had another good week, uh, despite the rise in bond yields. The German DAX, for instance, was up 4%. The French CAC 40 was up 4.4%, and even the battered old FTSE 100 was up 1.9%. Further away, Japanese equities were also up with the Nikkei 225 last week, up 2.9% or 8.3% year to date. In that case, however, I'm, I'm inclined to think it does actually have something to do with the domestic economy. Last week, for instance, it was reported in Japan that leading indicators, leading economic indicators were up sharply in January and that the Eco Watcher survey, which investors watch very closely, uh, was, was strongly positive last month with both the outlook and the current conditions uh, indices both both improving sharply. And also that uh, machine tool orders, which are a good proxy for future economic growth, were up 36.7% year on year in January. That'll be, I think, something for Prime Minister Suga to brag about when he becomes the uh, first major Western leader to have a face-to-face -face meeting with the new US president when he meets him in the White House next month. I guess that's a poke in the eye for both our own Bojo and for Germany's Mrs. Merkel. Japan gets in there first. But what about China? Well, Biden has been trying to rally his quad allies, uh, Japan, Australia, and India, into a sort of anti-Beijing alliance. Um, his new Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, is due to meet the top Chinese foreign policy officials in Alaska next week to discuss human rights issues and intellectual property theft. But, it's a big but, Xi Jinping is riding high, following in particular last week's National People's Congress, which went off about as smoothly as it could possibly do, without even much international blowback after further containments of uh, Hong Kong's alleged autonomy, though I note in the papers today that we are apparently going to take the Chinese to court, as we used to say when I was a kid, you and whose army. The fundamental reason for the fact that Xi Xi is riding so high is that China's economic model seems to be working. I remain skeptical about any Chinese statistics, but it was reported last week that Chinese exports were up 61% year on year in January and February, which are always lumped together for, for because of the Golden Week holiday, that uh, total vehicle sales, cars and trucks, were up 365% year on year in February, and that despite US sanctions, foreign direct investment was up 31.5% last month. Pretty damn good. What's not to like? However, I suppose it's also worth noting that the Shanghai Comp, the uh, key equity index, actually fell 1.4% last week, though that suggests to me only that the markets now expect the uh, PBOC, the People's Bank of China, to step on the brakes a little bit uh, in the next month or so. What else? Well, I think I mentioned it last week, but the collapse of Greensill, uh, an alleged fintech that uh, sought to do for supply chain financing what Monzo and Revolut are said to have done for banking, and the uh, likely implosion of Sanjeev Gupta's uh, GFG alliance could turn out to be even more important than we all first thought. By the end of 2019, Greensill is claiming that it had apparently extended $143 billion worth of financing to 10 
million companies and suppliers in 175 countries. That's not chicken feed. Meanwhile, GFG employs at least 35,000 workers, primarily in European steel companies that no one else thought were viable at the time, but which have enormous political and social significance. If they go collapse, one can imagine that a few governments are going to go as well. But the real issue around the Greensill scandal is who's going to be left holding the bag. Will it be Credit Suisse, which packaged up Greensill to re uh, receivables for its high net worth individual clients, and which uh, provided Greensill with a $10 billion line of credit? Will it be Tokyo Marine, which seems to have ensured the bulk of Greensill's borrowings? Or will it be the Australian IAG Group or Japan's SoftBank? which uh, actually financed Green Sills expansion in the first place. There are also, I fear, the taxpayers, not least here in the UK, where the government's COVID relief schemes could be in the hole for up to a billion pounds. And of course, there's the question of what Green Sills collapse means for other players in the supply chain business. Don't assume that this is just a Green Sill problem. As for this week, well, the meeting between Blinken and his Chinese counterparts in Alaska will be important as a test of how tough Trump, uh, <laughs> Team Biden is really willing to be uh, as far as China is concerned. Closer to home, our own government is due to publish its long delayed integrated defense security and foreign policy uh, review, uh, which could recommend further cuts in army manpower, which won't go down well with the Americans. I also noted over the weekend the rather sad demise of VSO, voluntary, services over, voluntary service overseas, which was an important part of growing up for many people of my age in this country. Now, I appreciate that in our era of post-colonial post guilt, it had become difficult, if not impossible, to send big ignorant middle-class boys and girls to show the natives in Malawi or the Gambia how to run their country. But there is a real loss, not so much to the countries that we were allegedly helping, but to the UK itself. We are now a lot more ignorant than we ever were about just how poor people in foreign countries in Africa and Asia actually live. Facebook and Instagram aren't a real alternative to feet on the ground. It's also a big week on the central bank front with the Fed's Open Market Committee, the Bank of England's MPC and the Bank of Japan all meeting. Don't expect major policy changes at this stage, but the press conferences afterwards may be significant, not least in the UK where hawks and doves have tended to cancel each other out in the last few months. As far as economic releases are concerned, I guess the most important in the US are going to be the Empire State, that is New York State and Philadelphia Fed manufacturing surveys for March. But here in Europe, the ZEW economic survey is also due. But that will be important as a signifier of just how far the EU is behind the US and perhaps how far it is in front of the UK. Thanks for listening and uh, I hope to see you again next week.